Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to day two of Restoring the West 2019. Uh, my name is Alex Howe. I'm a PhD student here at USU. And I think this is either my fourth or fifth Restoring the West I've been to. I've always really enjoyed these conferences and learned some really valuable stuff from them. Uh, so I hope you guys are too. So if you could please take your seats and we'll get started. Uh, so our first speaker today is Elise Bokey. Uh, Elise has a 28-year career in Utah, working for natural resources agencies, including the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources, the Utah Fish and Wildlife Service, the NRCS, uh, and now the U.S. Forest Service, where she's the Deputy Director of Natural Resources. Uh, her experience with conservation, restoration partnerships, private land conservation, and improvement of forest condition has helped shape her understanding and perspectives on shared stewardship of our natural resources. So I'd like you all to join me in welcoming her up to the stage. Thanks for that, that introduction, Alex. Um, as he said, I'm Lee Spokey. I am the Deputy Director of Natural Resources for the Intermountain Region of the Forest Service, but I'm currently in an acting detail as the Planning Director. We have a lot of um, musical chairs over at the agency and we're all kind of playing different roles right now. But um, I'm excited to be here with you today. Is that getting feedback or is it okay? It sounds a little, a little echoey to me. Um, it's my understanding that um, our deputy regional forester, Mary Farnsworth, was first um, invited to speak to you today about shared stewardship. But as uh, schedules go, she is um, out in Washington, D.C. with our Cracker Jack shared stewardship team, and they are discussing and informing the regional, or excuse me, the Washington office about all the, the um, good work that we're doing with shared stewardship. And so while they couldn't be here today, um, they would have loved to have come and shared uh, the efforts that we've been uh, working on for the last several months. So, but you're, you're gonna get to hear it from me and um, I'm really excited to be here to present this information to you. So <clears throat> as I was preparing for this um, conference, I was thinking back to the many Restoring the West conferences that I've been able to attend and thinking about um, how it's evolved over the years and, and how informative and interesting they have always been. And I've always come away with a little nugget of knowledge, but also um, a renewed um, excitement for the work that we do and knowing that that work matters. So I thank you for that and being able to be a part of it today. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk to you about shared stewardship. First of all, I want to talk to you about <clears throat> who we are as an agency. Let's see. Got to get this going too. So the U.S. Forest Service, of course, is, a, is an agency within the Department of Agriculture. We're a multifaceted agency. We deal with everything from grazing to mining to recreation and timber harvest, all while providing the biggest municipal water supply in the country. We manage 154 national forests and 20 grasslands. We have an elite wildland firefighting team and the world's largest forest research organization. We provide technical and financial resources to both local and state governments, private landowners, and businesses. We also work government to government with tribes to manage and protect non-federal forests and the rangelands and watersheds associated with them. We also leverage the work we do through our partnerships, both public and private, both domestic and international, to do everything from planting trees, repairing trails, and outreach to our publics. In a word, we do a lot. We're very busy, um, as I'm sure many of you are too. But that doesn't come without its challenges. And beyond just the typical challenges that we all share also as far as financial resources and personnel capacity, we also have lots of other challenges, environmental challenges, we have um, persistent droughts. Um, we have invasive species. We have epidemics of insects and disease. All of this leading to acres and acres, thousands of acres, millions of acres of dead and dying trees across the landscape. The catastrophic fire, fires that result from those um, are devastating to our landscapes. Some say that this is happening because we've had a lack of coordination around the treatments that we're doing on the landscape 
and we're not treating at the right scales to make a difference across the landscape to get the outcomes that we really need to see to make meaningful um, changes on the landscape. <clears throat> so what does this mean long term with these challenges? Of course it means we have greater risk to communities and firefighters. We have extensive impacts to our watersheds. We have la loss of wildlife habitat and other natural resources. Every year there are more losses of lives due to fire and, and loss of property. And of course there's loss of economic opportunities across our forests. So, what are we going to do about these challenges? Well, at the agency that I work for, at the Forest Service, we're trying to make, take a new approach to managing our lands. <clears throat> we know we need to recommit to working across boundaries and jurisdictions. We need to really emphasize the landscape treatments that are needed on a landscape scale to mitigate the catastrophic wildfires that are so devastating to our landscapes. We need to focus on outcomes, not outputs. And we're going to do this through what we're calling an outcome-based strategy for shared stewardship across landscapes. This strategy was developed in about a year ago with the department and uh, a team at the national level from the Forest Service in order to advance the work that we need to do on our landscapes. So what is an outcome-based strategy for shared stewardship? It's really a pretty simple concept. It's integrated decision-making with our state and other partners. It's working with states and other partners to apply the best science available to identify those priority landscapes that will make a difference on our landscape and to invest in targeted treatments where we'll get the highest payoff. So some ask, why now? What's, what's the driver now? Well, frankly, the scale of the challenge is just too great not to act. Uh, we all see the acres and acres of dying and, and uh, dead uh, forests. And um, there's substantial burnable landscapes out there. There's extensive insect and disease mortality. And watershed and habitat degradation are prevalent across the landscape. The time to act is now. And the opportunity is now. We have a positive authorizing environment. We have advanced science and mapping tools that can help us. And we have a growing recognition, recognition of our shared challenges. <clears throat> so shared stewardship, what's different about this? We've been working with partners for a long time. Many of you out in the audience here today, we've worked with you. So what is the different about shared stewardship? <clears throat> shared stewardship is a partnership, and it is based on a foundation of a history of other partnerships. We have several um, very positive partner efforts that we've engaged in over the last years, including the Joint Chiefs uh, Landscape Restoration Program, the, um, the uh, <laughs> collaborative forest landscape restoration and uh, the wildland fire strategy. All of these are creating the foundation and the base that we are building off of for our shared stewardship strategy. <clears throat> we also have some new um, authorities that we've received in the last few years. Authorities that expand our use of the good neighbor authority from just working with states to also working with counties and tribes. And we also have new NEPA authorities, and we're working on an extensive uh, revision to all of our NEPA policies. So we're setting the stage, and uh, the time is right for us to act, and things are evolving a little bit that we see a difference in the shared stewardship effort. So. Now I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about where we are with shared stewardship. What you have here is a timeline of uh, the process that we've been working through. And uh, last August, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, the secretary and the chief, Vicki Christensen, announced the shared stewardship strategy and rolled it out. Over the next few months, there were a lot of 
um, webinars and, and uh, outreach um, within the agency to educate everybody on what the effort would look like. And then in, in uh, December, uh, at the Western Governors Association, shared stewardship was rolled out there. And it was well received and an MOU was signed in support of the shared stewardship efforts. Immediately after that, the state of Idaho was the first state to sign a shared stewardship agreement. We had worked through it with them for a while and uh, in mid-December that agreement was signed. And then we promptly went on furlough. So we had a little delay in things. But as soon as we got back, we got back up on the horse and uh, continued our efforts to develop shared stewardship um, and spread it across um, our states. So in early spring, a couple more states came on with their shared stewardship agreements. And I point this out because what I want, what the significance is of these various um, states signing on is the fact that every one of these is different. These, um, these agreements or MOUs are all different and they're catered to each state that they're developed in. We don't have a blueprint for what shared stewardship looks like in any given state. So we're building these things as we go. Now some may think that that's like building the airplane as you're trying to fly it down the runway, but you could also look at it as an opportunity for flexibility and the, abil the ability to be nimble and responsive to the needs of the state and the partners that we're working with. So that's how we see it. And it's been really uh, a good effort. So then um, in May, mid-May, um, again, the, the secretary and the chief came out here to Utah and with the governor we signed the Utah Shared Stewardship Agreement. It was a pretty big deal. As uh, Mary Farnsworth likes to say, it's kind of a big deal. And uh, those of you who know her will get that joke. <laughs> but um, so it was signed in mid-May and we have been working on that and I'm going to go into some details um, about some of the efforts uh, here in a second. But, and then since then, a few other states have been signed and the most recent one um, was there in, in uh, as recently as in September. So Region 4 is on the forefront of, of shared stewardship in the nation and uh, we've really embraced it and are looking forward to uh, you know, engaging and making shared stewardship the way we manage lands here in the West. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about these, these shared stewardship agreements. Um, <clears throat> the first, as I mentioned, is the Idaho shared stewardship. And with, with this agreement, um, there are four commitments that we agreed to. So I'm just gonna run through them quickly. We committed to jointly work with our stakeholders to identify land management priorities and the desired outcomes. We committed to collaborate on mutually agreed upon projects to reduce fuels and, <clears throat> and, risk and wildfire risk to communities, to create and sustain jobs, and improve forest health and resiliency. We committed to jointly identify a list of initial projects or priority landscape areas, one in the north and one in the south, in which to do our work. And we committed to double the annual acres treated through active management by 2025. Those were the four commitments that we made. And uh, we've been diligently working towards those. In fact, uh, July 1st, the two priority areas that you see here on the map were identified um, with the help of some extensive modeling through RMRS, uh, Rocky Mountain Research Station, as well as the Idaho Department of Lands and, uh, and others. Um, these two areas were selected where we could uh, make the greatest uh, investment and get the highest payback uh, for the outcomes that we seek to achieve. The team is now working on identifying specific um, practices on the ground that they will engage in um, in the next few years. Let's see. Utah, the Utah Shared Stewardship Agreement, again, signed in mid-May this year. Um, this agreement um, has six commitments that I'm gonna share with you here. <clears throat> 
We committed to the existing partnerships, programs, and initiatives that have been so successful in Utah. We committed to working together to identify and map shared priorities for protecting at-risk communities and watersheds across all lands. We committed to making joint decisions and sharing resources for immediate and ongoing work in priority areas. We committed to engage the local communities in dialogue and learning about the active management and desired landscape scale outcomes, including capacity building and economic development opportunities. We committed to shared planning efforts, including integration of our Utah Forest Action Plan and the Forest Service's five-year veg management plan. And lastly, we committed to co-managing wildfire risks and supporting each other in decisions that we have made together. So pretty significant commitments that we've made through shared stewardship. And <clears throat> since this agreement's been signed, um, we have been working diligently with our folks from the state, um, and a lot has been accomplished. Let's see here. So as soon as the agreement was signed, we set to work identifying a 2019 program of work where we identified a number of activities that needed to take place um, in order for us to get work done on the ground. And it spanned everything from increasing our planning efforts, increasing our implementation rates, um, reaching out to the public, um, as well as our own employees with education. Um, it included um, other training. It included um, working with our industry um, our, our wood industries to help um, understand how we can be supportive for those industries um, and a host of other things. And this map here shows some of the work that is um, actually has been initiated now as part of our FY19 um, program of work for our U Utah Shared Stewardship. We've got work going on on the uh, UWC, the Uinta Wasatch Cache, the Manti LaSalle, and the Dixie National Forest are all um, poised to begin work on the ground, uh, in some cases, this fall. So a lot of this work is being done with a commitment that the state made initially of $2 million through the legislature that the Forest Service matched. And those are, were our um, initial commitments to funding for this effort. However, not long after the agreement was signed and we started working on this program of work, um, the, the Forest Service and the state committed to additional funds. And through our joint commitments, we are gonna bring 20, approximately $20 million to, um, to, to work on the ground over the next four years here in Utah. So a pretty significant uh, commitment was made um, through this plan. All right, so what's next for shared stewardship? Well, first and foremost, we want to keep the momentum going in Idaho and Utah. In, in the few short months that these um, agreements have been signed and have been in, in, uh, in play, we've accomplished a lot. Um, we have a very robust team here in Utah that's working on shared stewardship. We have uh, team members that sit uh, over at Forestry, Fire, and State Lands and in DNR, as well as um, in the regional office of the Forest Service. In Idaho, they are working towards identifying their team members, uh, both um, in the north part of the state and the south part of the state. And we want to ensure that those, both of those teams, um, or all, you know, all of the teams, are poised and have the support that they need to be successful in this effort and to work uh, closely with our forests and areas to be able to be successful. Next, we want to move towards really supporting the um, remaining for, uh, states in our region, which include Nevada and Wyoming, in their efforts to develop their own shared stewardship plans. We've had conversations um, and several meetings in both of those states and are very op uh, optimistic that we will soon have signed plans in both of those states. And they're going to look very different than uh, both Idaho and Utah. 
Um, and we're still working out those details. But again, that's the beauty of this program is it's catered to the state and the individual needs of those uh, states and the landscapes that they have. And then we would really like to see um, expansion of the dialogue with our partners where we have <clears throat> um, a lot of potential in the, in the other partners out there, particularly where we have mutual goals and common interests and want to effectively respond to the increasing complexities of the challenges we face. So shared stewardship is new. It's just getting a foothold here, but we believe that uh, there's some great opportunity to work closely, to stand shoulder to shoulder with our partners, make decisions, um, and find ways to um, achieve outcomes and not just outputs. So. With that, um, I think I have a few minutes for questions. Very good. Th thank you for that. And I couldn't agree more. Um, this is a challenge that we have nationally, and um, we are working to, to try to accommodate that capacity in some of our other partnerships. But um, it's recognized that, that we need more support and expertise in the, uh, in the biomass field. So thank you. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Fair question. Um, and I, I certainly don't have all the answers. But um, in 2018, I believe it was, um, they, as, as a part of the omnibus bill, I believe, uh, we had what's called the fire fix, which made some changes to how we fund our fire organization. And it, um, in a nutshell, it uh, removed th the way we would fund firefighting by taking funds from our other funded programs and move it over to fight fires. We no longer do that. That was set to be, um, to come into play this year in FY 2020. And we are expecting, given that, that change in how we fund our fire organization, that we will see some increased funding coming to um, the other parts of the organization, including our, a lot of our efforts um, for uh, hazardous fuel treatments. <laughs> So is it enough? No. I mean, our, uh, what we need to do is, is um, incredibly ambitious and, uh, you know, there's, we need a lot of money. So this isn't going to be the only answer, but um, it, it's a step in the right direction. So, yeah. You mentioned that you were targeting high priority areas, and I'm curious uh, to what extent different partners were involved in identifying those areas. And Right. So good question. Um, so the, the process of identifying those priority areas really centered around um, catastrophic wildfire risk, of course, that is a big driver for us. And then uh, coupled with, um, with our watersheds and particularly water sources. So there was, um, in both states, there was a fairly, ex in both Idaho and Utah, there was a fairly extensive effort to do some 
uh, various modeling. Uh, we worked with the, um, the state uh, here in Utah. We worked with forestry, fire, and state lands. And then we had some of our uh, analysts and modelers working with various uh, water data sets, um, the uh, drinking water uh, zone protection, I believe it is, along with various data sets um, around risk of fire and various conditions, and then hazardous fuel conditions on the ground. And through that effort, that's, that's where we're taking our first stab at where the priority watersheds are. That effort has been underway since about, uh, well, as soon as the, probably before the agreement was signed. Um, and uh, we hope to be rolling that out. It's, it's being reviewed by senior leadership um, as we speak, so. Did that answer your question? Okay. Yes. Um, where you see optimism, I see concern. Um, I'll just be honest with you. Um, states typically, or generally speaking, have a short-term interest, and the federal government managing land has a sustainable long-term interest. I can see that the states would get a lot from federal land. I don't see the other side of the equation, so perhaps I'm missing something. What is the federal government getting from the states in these shared stewardship agreements? Okay. So um, we are getting a shared vision of what needs to be done on the landscape. Um, some of that's pretty obvious, and uh, we've identified that and, um, and, and can move forward with, with the actions that need to take place to address those issues. Um, that said, we can't do it all and we need the input from the state and standing next to them to really identify what those, those priorities are. And in some cases, they are bringing a lot to the table. Sometimes it's financial resources. Sometimes it's technical resources. Um, and so they, they are invaluable players in this effort to, to manage our uh, public lands. Um, and I realize it's concerning for many but we feel like it, it's a better approach to partner um, and stand side by side with our states um, to hopefully get a better outcome that we're all seeking as opposed to just trying to um, piece away acre by acre with various outputs without seeing the outcomes that we need for resilient landscapes. So, Frank. Absolutely. Um, as I said, one of the first commitments in the Utah um, agreement was to recognize and embrace those existing partnerships and efforts that are ongoing in the state. And of course, the, the blue ribbon one of the state is WRI um, and has had, you know, that effort has seen incredible successes. And uh, we would like to, to work very closely with that. Um, that might not always be possible, but that's uh, certainly what we would strive to do and not have conflict, certainly, with that program. I think we're going to have to cut off the questions okay. there. Uh, but just a reminder, just a quick reminder that there, everyone will be uh, available for talking during the break like yesterday. So Absolutely. If you have more questions, please feel free to All right. Oh. There. I take them.